NFL Week 11 line moves. Suma, before we get there, got to ask about that epic environment in Germany this past Sunday when the Seahawks took on the Bucks in Munich. What was it like for you watching the first ever NFL game in your native land? I thought it was absolutely awesome. I thought the atmosphere in the stadium was great. Uh, the German fans were singing stuff like Country Road, Sweet Caroline, Um I also think that the crowd was more pro Seahawks. So sometimes it got very, very loud when the Bucks were on third down or something and or when the Seahawks made a big play. I think in hindsight, it was a very, very good advertising for having NFL games in Germany. Um, going to be exciting how it's like in Frankfurt next year. But I think it was a very, very good start for the NFL in Germany. Um, I've been to, I think, three London games. Um, just from watching it on TV, it felt like the atmosphere was even better than in, in Wembley or Tottenham. But that's just a, a subjective impression. Um, but yeah, I think great start, great atmosphere. Fans were very exciting. And yeah, can't wait to see if the NFL will um, put more games um uh, in Germany in, in the upcoming years. I mean, we had, I think, three London games this year. So um, it might be time to make it uh, two and two. Yeah, I don't know anybody who would want to push back on that notion after the atmosphere we saw this past Sunday at Alliance Stadium. And one thing you touched on, I got to follow up on quickly here, country roads. Is that a hit in Germany? Or, or I was just blown away that so many people were singing that during the two-minute warning, even into the first play out of the warning. What's the deal with the popularity of Country Roads in Germany? It's a very popular party song. So like uh, on every big party at like 2 a.m. in the morning when everyone is drunk, you will hear Country Roads. <laughs> oh, it's very popular. Over here. That sounds good. I'll have to look forward to it when I can uh, finally in these next few years make my first trip out there for Oktoberfest, probably get my fill of John Denver and Country Road. So plenty to look forward to down the road. But for the purposes of this coming week in the NFL, we've got plenty to look forward to right now as well. So let's dive in. Starting with the Thursday night game, Tennessee at Green Bay. We've seen some line movement in favor of the Packers. They opened minus two up to Packers minus three, minus 120. Suma, how much of this is a reaction to what we saw from the Packers this past Sunday, not just covering, but winning outright as a sizable home dog to the Cowboys, and how much of it might be the market doubting Tennessee and Ryan Hill's status, even if he's playing, not necessarily looking too close to 100%. I think that the look-ahead line of being under a field goal made sense back then, but now with two more data points, I think that the... Overtime win by the Packers against the Cowboys might have been a little bit fluky, so I, I would not point too much to, to that result. But I think that what's very important is that they found life in the passing game, especially in their deep passing game with Christian Watson. And that was an element that was completely lacking for the Packers offense over the first nine weeks. And this is, in my, at least in my opinion, some signal going forward because they desperately needed that vertical element in the passing game. And they came out, out with a, I would say, solid game plan. It was very surprising to me that they went so run heavy. It worked out well in hindsight. But I also think that this game and the way that the Packers connected with Christian Watson down the field is very promising for that offense going forward. Um, the Titans, there are two components. Like first, Ryan Tenhill doesn't seem to be 100%. If he had a, a high ankle sprain, which seems likely, usually there's the timeline of four to six weeks. And four weeks would be this upcoming Sunday. So he's still within the four weeks that are usual um, in terms of healing for a high ankle sprain. We saw it with Mac Jones, who was also not 100% um, after four weeks. So I think there's an element to it that Ryan Tannehill is not 100%. The offense is not in a great state right now. 
uh, the, the Packers passing defense, despite um, having some injuries, is still very good and played very well on some key third downs against the, against the Cowboys as well. Even though I thought that the Cowboys offense um, had their will for, for almost the, the entire game, but the, back, but, the, but the Packers made a few key plays late. And the Titans offense is not on the same level as the, the Cowboys. And furthermore, the Titans are also dealing with some injuries, like Bud Dupree will likely not play. Um, Kelly Farley is on IR. Elijah Morgan was banged up. Christian Fulton had a hamstring strain, but he was fully practicing yesterday. Uh, and then there's the uncertainty around um, Jeffrey Simmons. Jeffrey Simmons was, I think, DNP on Monday, limited yesterday. Um, don't know whether he's going to play would be a big loss. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, com it's a combination of more optimism about the Packers. Short week at home at Lambeau. Uh, I think there might be freezing temperatures. Um, and also the Titans defense potentially missing a few key guys. I think it's it's just a mix of a, a lot of things. And um, it's probably logical that the Packers are at least if a minus three favorite on a short week at home. Well, if we might see freezing temperatures at Lambeau Field on Thursday night, we're going to probably see that. And then some Sunday as we flip to the early window when the Browns take on the Bills in Buffalo. And the total has really shown this. An opener of 47 and a half down all the way to 41 at the time of this recording. Sumo, what's your current read for the forecast Sunday in Orchard Park? And just how low do you think this total can go? I don't think it will get too much lower because we had these reports i think on monday night to tuesday morning that there could be a potential crazy snowstorm hitting buffalo and the market reacted properly that there was there were also increasing winds in the forecast right now we are looking at 20 miles per hour sustained winds with gusts up to the um, upper 30s but as of now, as I'm looking at, at the weather forecast, there's the possibility that we might not see any new snow during the game, and it, it might be stopping. Uh, it, it might stop snowing right before game time. The pre pro probability is hanging around 15 to 20 percent, or 10 to 20 percent throughout the game. So there's a real possibility that we might not deal with snow at all, and it's just about the the wind factor. And the Bills have a good offense. The Browns have a, a have an above average offense. And if it's only the wind without the snow, that would be the, the, the big problem to begin with because snow itself is not a major problem for totals. It's just a problem in combination with the wind and uh, when it's really snowing during the game. But a, a layer of snow on the football field is never a big never a major issue in terms of scoring but the wind will be and the wind is what we have to monitor uh, throughout the week right now we are looking at uh, circa hanging at 41 i would be surprised if we get too far lower uh, because if there's not going to be snow in the forecast and we are just de dealing with the 20 miles per hour and we have two offenses that can move the ball maybe efficiently on the ground we might see our bottom uh, at around 40, 41. From the wind and possible snow in Buffalo to the more comfortable confines indoors in Indianapolis, the Colts hosting the Eagles. Philadelphia was a soft minus nine and a half at one point before kicking off Monday night. Reopener after that Eagles first loss of the season to Washington had Philadelphia laying seven and a half points. And now we've seen the line cross through the seven Eagles currently favored by six and a half at Indianapolis on Sunday. Suma, do you see this as more of a buy on the Colts after a pretty interesting storyline leading up to their win over the Raiders this past Sunday? <laughs> or any sell signs on the Eagles after, again, their first loss of the season and some injuries to boot? Yeah, very interesting line move. Um, our friend Adam Chernoff had something to do with it. Um, right now, it's shaded towards the seven again. And I would not be surprised if we saw a little bit more Eagles money throughout the week because some folks might see this line move as, a, as an overreaction or something that has moved too far because I think the opener was 9.5. Is that correct? 
Uh, we Prior to Monday Night Football, there were some nines and nine and a halfs out there, I think. Yeah, okay. So so what has happened? The Eagles lost Dallas Goddard. That's, that's a major injury. Uh, absolutely correct. But it was a game that you just sometimes can lose. I mean, Washington had, I think, three or four turnovers. They At some point, they, they were converting like every third down possible. Um, I think Jalen Hurts had a pretty good game. It was just that two, two fumbles after some big plays through the air and also one interception where the ball slips through Edgy Brown's hand. So I personally would not overreact too much to that, to that um, Eagles loss against, against the commies. But I think what, what will be the talking point this week is the Colts rushing offense against the Eagles run defense. The Eagles run defense, I think they rank something like 27th in DWA on the ground. And also the Washington Commanders, they didn't blow us away in the stat sheet, but they were able to consistently get some gains on the ground. And the Colts found some life in their run game against the Las Vegas Raiders. We might uh, discuss how much to value that um, regarding the state of, of the Raiders' defense. But we saw that the Colts were running the ball well. We saw that the Eagles are having some real issues stopping the run uh, probably all season long. And now it becomes a very intriguing matchup with the Colts' uh, maybe new life running game against that Philly um, Eagles um, run defense. Overall, in general, I think there are some logical reasons why Bettors took the Colts north of seven. But I think that there can also be a good case made for why some folks might buy back the Eagles at six and a half. And that's what already happened a little bit here. So you can see the logic behind the way that the market has unfolded in Eagles Colts. I'm curious for any logic you can see when it comes to the betting market so far this week for Jets Patriots. New England opened minus four hosting the Jets. That line came down to minus three. Now we have seen some Patriots money as we've started to record the consensus line at the moment. Patriots minus three, minus 120. But Suma, even considering an expensive three for the Patriots, this line did open at four. And both of these teams are off the bye last week. So what's changed at all to move this number down? I think what's changed is that the Jets had a very good data point in their game against the Bills where Zach Wilson looked a little bit more comfortable when he was getting the ball out real quickly um, against the uh, Bills, um, let's call it more of a zone defense. Um, their defense is still playing incredibly incredibly well. And from the Patriots, we all only got the data point of just hammering the, the calls in their last game because they were before they fired their coach with Sam Ellinger under center, who was completely overran in that game against that Bill Belichick um, defense. So I think that the market early in the week was simply playing a decent Jets team, getting more than a field goal at uh, Foxborough. But also, it's very interesting to think about the about our reference point from three weeks ago when these teams played first. And in that game, the Patriots, I think, closed minus three on the road at New York. So this game is now flip-flopped uh, in terms of home field advantage. And we are seeing a minus, or we saw a minus three for the pass as well. And that might be, or might have been the entry point for a few betters to push this back towards a minus three and a half. And yeah, that's, that's basically from my point of view, what, what happened? Like some people were betting the three and a half and four with the Jets getting more than a field goal and some betters will play back the Patriots laying three at home. Interesting back and forth. Um, let's see where the market uh, or how the market develops um, going um, to Sunday and what the injury report will also dictate because the Jets might be getting Corey Davis back and the Patriots were also a little bit banged up in their first game without David Andrews, uh, without Devontae Parker, who got hurt, I think, after the, the second snap. What, what's very interesting about the first game is that when you look at the box score, the Jets were averaging three yards per play more than the Patriots, but you didn't really have had that impression when re-watching that game. 
the Jets had a few big plays like a, a pop pass, um, a pass into the flat where no one was following the running back. Um, but overall, it, it was also a very bad game for Zach Wilson with three interceptions. So it, it was basically just the, the, the Jets getting a few big plays while not having a great success rate offensively. Yeah, this one is a fascinating case in trying to read the market for me because I hear you on betters giving the Jets a significant boost off of that outright win over the Bills and then maybe discrediting the Colts win over, or excuse me, the Patriots win over the Colts just a little bit because of Indy's situation. So I hear you there, but even with all that accounted for, on Sunday evening, Circa opened Patriots minus four. So that was after those two games had happened, Jets over the Bills, Patriots over the Colts, after both of those two teams had just had their bye. So I'm still not sure what all has changed, but I do think it's interesting that you touch on the fact that home field has flipped and we're looking at about the same line here. Zooming out is just a more general concept as we start to get into the part of the season where we're going to see more divisional rematches. And as home field flips and we maybe anchor a bit toward closing lines from the first games between certain teams earlier on this season, how much value do you put to you know, assigning any sort of, you know, anchoring point to what the closing line was in a first matchup between two teams, albeit at a different venue. Yeah, it definitely matters. And then it depends on putting context to it. Like there could be a closing line, let's say team A, team B, the line closes six. And a few weeks later, we are looking at a two and a half or three. And some people might think, oh, but the closing line was six a few weeks back. That's too much of, of an adjustment. But there could be some things happening in the meantime that made absolutely sense to push this number completely in an opposite direction, like injuries, like teams collapsing, um, not playing well or something like that. So we always have to, when we anchor towards um, uh, earlier closing lines, we always have to put uh, that into context and, and think about what happened um, between then and now. Fair enough. Well, from one very intriguing game involving one of your teams in Suma's Jets to another involving Jacob's Giants hosting the Lions this weekend. We've seen the Giants go from four point favorites at the opener down to three point favorites. So we've seen some Lions money early in the week. Jacob, I know that you're going to be at this game. So curious to hear what you're looking forward to on Sunday. I'm guessing another Giants ticket in pocket, considering that this is the second straight week on the show that we're seeing some money come in against the Giants at home, meaning even if you wanted to bet them anyway, now there might be a little bit of added value in play as well. Yeah, last week we were talking about uh, on one of the podcasts, we had the Giants were minus seven around there. And then Chernoff did a release, brought it down to four and a half. I think it touched four at one point at some books. I was waiting for a six and a half to bet the Giants. They covered that, but I ended up betting them at four and a half. So got a really good number there. This week, they've been about three, three and a half. It started at four. If it touches two and a half, I'm going to be betting that. If I get like a pretty good price in a three, I'll consider that as well, just because I'm going to be at the game. But uh, for this one, I mean... I'm I'm looking hopefully forward to a Giants win. The Lions have won two in a row, but um, you know even when you want to bet on your favorite teams, it's always good to find the right value on the bet. So not to force that one up. I just want to keep the wind train rolling while I'm there. It's been yeah quite the wind train so far this season. I think seven and two yeah. for the Giants entering <laughs> yeah. this one. Who would have thought? But Suma, I do wonder if the market with this Lions money is. Considering the Giants' final score last weekend, an eight-point win over the Texans to be a bit of a phony final, the Giants were outgained pretty clearly in yards per play, but variance broke in their favor when we look at things like late downs, the red zone, turnovers, things that are very impactful in the outcome of one game, but not necessarily as predictable week over week. What do you make of this early week move on the Lions on the road taking on the Giants, who just seem to keep finding ways to win week in and week out? I think I think it makes sense. The the Giants are still not um, rated very highly in the betting market. Sorry, Jacob. Um, but I mean, the Giants' defense. I wrote it uh, in my column um, uh, for the Hammer on Monday. The Giants' defense ranks dead last in EPA per play on early downs, but they rank I think third or fourth or something on late downs. So there's a pretty crazy gap. So 
you can easily move the ball on the Giants' defense. They are not great overall. But for whatever reason, they always seem to find ways to get a key stop on third down. I think Wink Martindale plays a big role in that, and there is some signal to it uh, because he always comes up with great play calls on, on those late downs. Kudos to him. But I still wonder how sustainable you can be on late downs when you are so bad on early downs. At some point, the luck got to revert a little bit towards your opponents on late downs, um, especially when we consider that the Giants' defense is not really stacked with talent across the board. So um, this game is, is really interesting in that regard because on the other side, the, the Lions' defense is absolutely terrible on third down. So it might be a very interesting potential re regression game where we um, might be able to draw some conclusions afterwards in terms of how sustainable uh, or is performance on late downs. Um, but otherwise, the Giants' offense has been quietly, sneakily above average over the past couple of weeks. Um, but also, their offensive line is banked up. Their right receiving group is still not very great. I don't know whether Daniel Bellinger will be back this week. They had uh, like two very um, broken plays against the Texans. One where um, Daniel Jones on, I think it was a third and 10 or something, he threw it into the into the flat to Darius Slayton. And usually, I think it, it was Derek Stingley on the other side. Derek Stingley basically had him for a stop, but he couldn't make the tackle and Slayton goes 60 yards uh, to the house. I mean, these are the kind of plays that are not really sustainable going forward. And the the Lions offense found some new life. Amon Ra St. Brown is back healthy. Uh, they might get DJ Chark back. Their offense is, um, is has been playing uh, better lately. So, yeah, I think that market move from four, from four to three uh, makes a lot of logical sense when you consider the current situations and when you um, consider some of the maybe unsustainable elements that both teams possess. Some shots fired at Jacob's Giants, but I think he's <laughs> used to it by now. And as he said, if the wind train keeps rolling, then he'll probably continue to absorb it with a smile on his face. But Suma, you mentioned sustainability in the case of positive variance for the Giants being a possible X factor in this one. Moving on to the late window on Sunday, I'm wondering how sustainable these horrible runs have been to start the season for both the Raiders and the Broncos. Denver hosting Las Vegas, opened a three-point favorite. Denver came down to minus two and a half. We did see some minus two and a half, minus 120s recently also become, you know, maybe some minus threes at even money on the board. So a little bit of two-way action in this one. What do you make of a pretty tough game to decipher between two of the more interestingly bad teams in the league so far in the Raiders and Broncos. You guys got to tell me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the Broncos, they are missing, I think, three or four starters on their offensive line. When I'm not wrong, they are missing Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, Russell Wilson is on a steep decline. Um, on the other side, we have the Raiders offense that is also on a steep decline. No Darren Waller, no Hunter Renfro. Uh, no cohesion, no sync um, on their offense whatsoever. And this is really like a, a little toilet bowl between these two teams. Um, personally, on the game, I don't have a strong opinion either way. I think anything from two and a half to three in that kind of range makes sense. Broncos are at home. Their defense is playing on a, on a very, very high level all season long. Maybe they get Justin Simmons back. Um, the Raiders defense is absolutely atrocious. So I think the market leaning towards Broncos as a favorite makes sense. But personally, I just don't have a strong opinion. And I'm really, really struggling with what to make out of these two teams. I think you have plenty of company when it comes to struggling what to make out of both the Raiders and the Broncos. So let's move on. Sticking in the AFC West, Sunday Night Football, the Chiefs visiting the Chargers. Kansas City opened a seven-point road favorite. That's come off the seven. Now Chiefs minus six and a half across the board. And Suma, I'm hearing whispers of the Chargers possibly getting back one or both of their top two wide receivers and Keenan Allen and Mike Williams this week. What do you make of their prospects to suit up on Sunday and how that might tie in 
with a small line move in the Chargers' favor early on this week. Yeah, so uh, this game, when we are speaking about anchoring towards closing lines, in week two, this game closed Chiefs minus four when the Chargers were still very, very healthy. I think they were without Keenan Allen. On the other side, the Chiefs were only missing Trent McDuffie, but both rosters were pretty, pretty healthy. And now we have the adjustment of home field advantage. I mean, the, the Chargers, you know it best, they still don't have the greatest home field advantage. There will probably be um, a lot of Chiefs fans in the stadium. So there's not a major home field advantage adjustment to be made. But with the injuries and with the way that the Chiefs offense has been playing, uh, a touchdown spread early in the week uh, without uh, having too much clarity about uh, the injury situation made a lot of sense. And I think from now on, we are now looking at a six and a half and a total of 50. I think that the, the injury situation will entirely dictate where the market will go. Um, Judo Smith-Schuster is still in the concussion protocol. Marcus Velda scantling was out with an illness today. I don't think that he will be out, but just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and, and on the other side, if Mike Williams had a high ankle sprain, it might be a little bit too early, but but you will never know. Keenan Helen, uh, I mean, it's it's a complete wild card with his hamstring strain. If they get both guys back, or at least one, uh, that's a strong argument for the Chargers uh, because um, no Gerald Everett. I mean, I made some notes about which positions the Chargers were missing after the game against 49ers. Left tackle, right tackle, wide right receiver one, wide right receiver two, tight end one, tight end two, defensive end one, defensive tackles two, three, four, five, cornerback one, and kicker. I mean, <laughs> that's a crazy long list of injuries. Uh, on the defensive side, they won't get those guys back, but if they can get, get uh, but if they can get back either Keenan Allen or Mike Williams and maybe Trey Pipkins at wide tackle. I think this this will be huge for this offense because over the the last uh, four weeks, which includes one bye week, the Chargers offense ranked 31st in offensive deep play. I mean, that offense right now is a complete mess. The only bright spot is Justin Herbert making or trying to make anything out of nothing. And yeah, one of Keenan Allen or Mike Williams would or could do wonders for this offense, especially when we are talking about a spread uh, of six and a half for Justin Herbert. As you talk about Herbert being the only bright spot in that Chargers offense, I feel like he's almost trying to MacGyver the situation with duct tape and paper clips at his disposal. So hopefully some firepower going to return in the form of Allen or Williams. Hopefully, as you mentioned, Pipkins can return to the right tackle slot to provide some protection up front. But we will have to monitor the injury status very closely for both teams for the Sunday nighter. And Suma, we've talked through all of the games that have seen some significant movement to this point in the week want to move on to Fabian's forecast. Anything we haven't touched on yet that you anticipate moving between now and kickoff and any reasons why that we could perhaps monitor over the course of these next few days? I think one interesting game will be San Francisco against Arizona because um, Marquise Hollywood Brown might be back. He was just, uh, or he just came off IR today. We don't know about Kyler Murray, about his hamstring. We don't know about the severity. So if we get positive news there, I could see some more um, Cardinals money uh, throughout the week. Um, With the Jets and Patriots, I would not be surprised if the Patriots came off the three and we saw something like minus three and a half um, come Sunday. Uh, The injury situation for the Patriots might get better. Like I said, Devontae Parker, Christian Barmore, David Andrews is back. Um, They had a few offensive line issues, especially today in practice, that might uh, might be solved by Sunday. That's something to keep in mind. Um, And what's also interesting is that the... uh, Let me see which game it was or which I had in mind the Bengals Steelers. So we saw some Steelers money early in the week. Um, The Bengals will still be without Jama Chase. GJ Reader might be back for the Bengals. But this right now, just just the subjective market uh, sentiment that that I'm getting, 
is that the Steelers might potentially move closer towards a field goal spread, especially if DJ Reader is or will not be a go this week because DJ Reader makes a significant difference for the Bengals defense uh, in terms of, of run stopping. He might be one of the best run stoppers in the game this season. And, and the Steelers probably need their run game uh, going um, against the Bengals um, at home. Tons of good betting insight there. As we start around the corner, I want to weave in the beer as well. As few things pair better with some good betting talk than some good beer. Jacob, as we do on this show each time this week, want to lead off with you. What was your best drinking experience since we last recorded Between the Lines? Uh, I guess the NFL Sunday was nice. Um, I talked about the beer I was going to enjoy, which was Thrust, a uh, pretty hazy, citrusy, stronger sort of IPA, or I guess a normal sort of expectation for an IPA but watching the Giants beat the Texans it was a good way for the Giants to bounce back and you know I I, I understand of course the criticism for this team there I, I still understand they're not a 7-2 and two team but we're nine games into the season playoffs are 100% a possibility for this team so it was nice to see that they used their bye week well they didn't fold after the loss to Seattle they got right back in the win column and they have a really tough schedule to end the season so important for them to win games like this against the Texans and this week against the Lions. They're winnable and enjoying a nice beer while they manage to get it done is always fun to do. Absolutely. And I was able to enjoy some nice beers with a friend who stopped by Saturday evening. I talked about Friday night watching USC with a can of all green everything, which is a hazy triple IPA by other half out of New York was able to put back one of those by myself uh, any more than that. And you get into some interesting territory with beers in the double digit ABV range. So on Saturday evening, had a few cans, similar style, similar ABV, but they were from a brewery out here in LA called Monkish, a powerhouse when it comes to anything hazy IPA related. And I feel like the 16 ounce cans have become really in vogue in the craft beer industry here in the US. Suma, I'm not sure if the 16 ounce can format has made inroads in Germany. And uh, if not, then I am not envious because that is a commitment when you're talking about a big beer with a pretty full body. So being able to split a few really good beers, eight ounce pours, you know, that was just absolutely perfect. That really hit the spot. So again, good beer and good company. Tough to beat that. And going from other half on Friday to Monkish on Saturday, uh, quite the dynamic one-two tandem in the world of hazy IPAs. So another good weekend in my book as far as the hops were concerned. Suma, I understand that you didn't do much in terms of trying new beers over the course of the last week, but I would have to think that with the NFL coming to Germany, there was a good experience or two that you were able to enjoy. <laughs> the, to be completely honest with you guys, when you talk uh, about your beer experiences from the weekend, I, I always feel like pretty weak and pretty boring uh, because over here we don't have that crazy versatility in terms of, of getting different beers and especially IPA. So, so every IPA that we get here is like from a very, very small brewery or it's imported from for, from some other country. So we are not a big IPA country. I personally love to drink um, IPAs. When I was uh, in the US once, uh, we did a, a round trip two weeks uh, through, throughout Florida. Like in every town that we were, I was able to get many different kinds of IPAs, like tons of regional stuff, a great experience. But over here, that's not really the case. And sometimes I'm, I'm a little bit sad that I cannot uh, or that I'm not um, uh, on the same level in terms of IPA experience with, with you guys. I've got to ask briefly, when you mentioned being in Florida not too long ago, the IPA of record for a while has been one called High Alive by Cigar City Brewing out of Tampa. Does that ring a bell by any chance or are there any standouts from that trip? No, I, I don't, I don't re remember that. Um, if you throw me a, a few names, I might recognize a few, but I, uh, I think it was 2018, um, and I cannot remember those names anymore. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Sometimes if you have enough good beers, then the memory gets a little bit foggy, but maybe we can refresh <laughs> your recollection, Sumo. We do have dates from Spanky Bet Bash 3 going to be taking place in Vegas next August. Not sure if you've seen that news or if you've been able to give any thought to attending. If you can, 
then uh, plenty of hops from the U.S. that you'll be able to get your hands on there. If I attend, um, I cannot wait to have some beers with you guys. Yeah. All right. Well, I will keep my fingers crossed. I'll probably be pestering you over the course of the next 10 months or so leading up to Bet Dash. <laughs> I know that tickets go on sale Black Friday here in the U.S. right after Thanksgiving. So it'll be fun to start making some plans accordingly. But plenty of betting and beer talk to come in the almost a year until that date arrives. So uh, we will just look forward to keeping in touch in that form in the meantime. That'll wrap it up for this week's episode of Between the Lines. I want to encourage everybody who's not doing so already to go ahead and follow Suma on Twitter at S-U-U-M-A-810. That's Suma810. You can also follow me at MLandis18. want to thank everybody for tuning in today. As a quick programming note, we're probably going to be back next Tuesday with Between the Lines to get ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday and the United States. And in the meantime, you can catch Jacob and I right back here on Friday with the Hitman for our NFL Week 11 prop betting breakdown. Ups and ups and